handed down in my family was uh, uh, called anise cookies. And they're a difficult cookie to make. You have to roll them out and then let them age overnight. And then you bake them the next day. My mother would take and make uh, like a dozen of these cookies on a sheet of wax paper and let them let all these various dozens of anise cookies she laid out on our dining room table. And that anise smell would go through the house uh, just waiting for them to age. And I would, that smell, I would just, it would always say Christmas is here to me. And shortly after that, my parents would uh, buy our Christmas tree. Now, growing up in Florida, we didn't have the kind of trees like you have around here. A lot of the, the pine trees that we use as Christmas trees, you see growing in people's yards. But in Florida, we had palm trees, and we had a different kind of foliage. We didn't have the type of pine trees like you have here. Ours were, were much different and ones that you would never use as a Christmas tree. So we had to import those trees, and I guess it made it all the more special when we bought the tree to bring into our house. My parents always bought a scotch pine Christmas tree, and it had the most wonderful fragrance about it. And that's another smell of the Christmas season that I remember. And later, as I uh, had a job as a delivery boy for a flower shop, and that was the only time of the year we got those particular greens in, those, that wonderful blue spruce and these firs and things that they would use to make the Christmas arrangements and taking them to people's houses, everybody would be so happy. They would be in a happy, joyful frame of mind. Even as uh, another thing I remember as a kid is my dad had built this train set that we only got down at Christmas, and it was on a four by eight sheet of plywood, and he had it painted green, and they had the cork road bed and the, the track and the trestles, and then we put the little plastic uh, buildings on the train, and as a kid, that was just great, playing with those trains. And they would mount the, the uh, Christmas tree on top of this train platform, and it would be almost like an umbrella above this little village we had built below. When, at night, when you turned the lights out and you saw just those pretty lights of the Christmas tree and then the street lights and of, the, uh, of the little train village below, it was just something magical about that. But the train, as it would run, that electric motor would give you that whiff of ozone. And, you know, uh, smells bring back more memories than any other sense, even, even sight. So to me, when I would smell that, those anise cookies and that scotch pine and that quick whiff of ozone, boy, that, I just knew that the Christmas season was in full bloom. Those are the kind of memories that I have. But as an adult, uh, I've grown to love a lot of the functions that we enjoy at Christmas. I love going to, when we have the cantata here at church or when we have the gatherings and that. Um, I love going to hearing the high school choral concert or going down to the college uh, to the Nutcracker. Or, and I really like it when we have our Christmas party at our house. What I really enjoy about Christmas is the fact that people actually make an extra effort to get together. I really love getting together with people. I think that is the thing we have missed most through this time of 2020 where we were so restricted on how we could gather. We have to wear these masks and we can't shake each other's hands or give each other a hug. We have to keep a distance in church can't get together and have the crowds that we once enjoyed. All of these things have put us in somewhat of a different frame of mind. Another thing I enjoy watching at Christmas are Christmas movies. Now, I, you know, Hallmark starts in February with their Christmas movies, and you get kind of sick of those after a while, but the movies I enjoy are the ones from the, the kind of the classic movies. And I'm sure everybody recognizes this one is a miracle on 34th Street. The, one of the things that I take from that movie is there's a, a certain scene in there where this lady is saying to the man who's playing Santa Claus, Christmas is still Christmas. And he said, oh, Christmas isn't a day. Christmas is a frame of mind. 
And he's absolutely right. The well-known essayist Edmund Ferber who said that Christmas isn't a season, Christmas is a feeling. And don't you, when, when the Advent comes, don't you get in a different frame of mind? Don't you get that good feeling? There's something special and magical about that. And we have these wonderful decorations which, with the lights that just kind of lifts our spirits. And even in a, a different kind of year like what we had, the Christmas decorations and the Advent season tended to lift our, our spirits some. Despite the fact that we couldn't do what we normally did, it did help our frame of mind. And there's a joyful, time, there's a joyful side to this season. Um, just, just like the shepherds that celebrated that first Christmas, where the angel said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. There's a difference to the word joy than being happy. In fact, I looked it up in the dictionary, and the dictionary defines joy as this, a very glad feeling. It isn't a glad feeling, it's a very glad feeling. Great pleasure, delight, warm elation, and I think all of those capture that feeling. It's, it's a warm feeling, a glowing feeling. And this is a feeling that we're commissioned to share. As Christians, accepting Christ gives us that joy in life, the joy of the Advent season, the coming of the Lord. But we're to share that joy. We're not to keep it to ourselves. And I think the Christmas season brings in a time of sharing. It's a time when we want to give and be benevolent. Uh, to, we think about giving gifts, but we also think about what's the gift we can give the Christ child. And that is a gift of giving to others. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, the nephew of Ebenezer Scrooge, his nephew Fred, who tells him, good, uh, Christmas is a goodly time, a time of giving. And though it hasn't fattened my purse by that much, it has done me good and will do me good, and so I choose to celebrate it. He has captured the joy of this season, which we are to celebrate. Now, there's a lot of work that goes into that this time, and if you're the, the type of family who ends up having family at your house, like we do, it takes an awful lot of effort to get prepared to have family stay. You gotta get the beds ready, the house fixed up, there's an awful lot of work that goes into the meals and Ramona fixes things weeks in advance because we always have a big Christmas Eve dinner and a different Christ, uh, Christmas Day dinner, both of which take an awful lot of work. But those end up being the centerpieces of the holiday because the family is all together sharing a meal together. And this is what we enjoy. We enjoy each other together. Now after Christmas, you kind of get things cleaned up and maybe you fix all those things that were broken and you put things back in order and, and you just kind of sit back and maybe you look at your Christmas tree and you kind of think about all the blessings you, re you received over that time and how nice it was to see family that you hadn't seen for a while. But then you have New Year's to look forward to. And sometimes you get to go to a New Year's Eve party, or maybe you celebrate at home and watch the ball drop in Times Square. And that's kind of a joyful time and whatever. But you know, after New Year's, like right now, when we begin to take the decorations down like we're going to do today here at church, and you no longer have these pretty things, the pretty lights and whatever to look at and those things to lift your spirits. And you look around your house and everything looks bare and maybe it's quiet because you don't have that family there making noise again. There's a bit of a letdown. There's a bit of, I don't know, a feeling of loss. I've heard a lot of people say this being this is a different year with all the restrictions of the COVID that we had to go through, that, you know, I'm kind of in a frump this year. It just doesn't feel like Christmas. Well, 
You know, that's a frame of mind that we've kind of been put into because we haven't been able to be free and enjoy the things that we normally did. But, you know, out of all of this, I think that maybe, maybe we've just received a blessing. And that blessing is the realization that maybe we need each other. Maybe the best things in life is that we enjoy being together and find enjoyment from one another. I hope that that's a realization that people make, and I hope that we will grow to appreciate each other a little bit more once we get through this time. We all have been through new territory, but this isn't the first time that this has happened to our nation. My just like we will tell stories of this time to future generations, I remember my grandmother and grandfather telling me about the flu epidemic of 1918, which was much worse than what we have suffered during this past year. In fact, my grandmother had two sisters that died in that epidemic, and to them it was a very uh, scary time, a very hurtful time just like many people have experienced today. But our nation got through it, and we will get through this as well. However, I'm a little bit concerned about how we have been conditioned. And certainly there's been enough concern about school children who have gone through a time where they didn't have the normal school year and some have suffered some psychological problems because of it. We can't use our facilities here like we normally do because and to, to house the children's activity and outside sporting events because of the restrictions that are in place and having to be careful about not spreading uh, this disease. But it has had an effect on us and has conditioned us in ways that maybe we haven't recognized. This is the kind of thing that I'm a little bit concerned about. This next slide, if you have looked at old movies, this is an old movie from 1956 called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And the reason I put this up there is there's a scene out of this that I think is something we should all remember. Of course, this movie is about these seeds that grow into these pods that end up growing into people. And people end up, uh, when they fall asleep, this, some kind of a transference takes place. But the individual that's created is, has all of the memory and personality of the person, but does not have the love. There's no emotion. And it takes over people. And when this doctor figures out what's going on and discovers these seed pods and how it's changing people, he, said, he makes an interesting statement. He said in his medical practice over the years, he's watched people lose their humanity a little bit at a time. And by stark contrast, where these pods have taken over somebody quickly, where it's noticeable, it wasn't noticeable losing our humanity a little bit at a time. And that's how I think that sometimes things happen in our lives. But it had, we had to fall asleep in this movie for that transference to take place. And I don't think we should fall asleep on maybe some of the conditioning that's happening, happened to us. Uh, When I was in college, uh, uh, my roommate, was in a program for, to study audiology, and he had to take some psychology classes because of his chosen profession. One of the classes he took was called behavior modification. Now, those of you who may know something about psychology, it's the effect on people that makes them behave a little differently than they normally would, and, and it's by virtue of them not even knowing what's happening to them. The students that were taking this class knew the subject and what it was about. And so before the semester started, they all got together and they said, look, whenever the professor is teaching from the right side of the room, we're going to be all attentive and listening and alert. 
And whenever he teaches from the left side of the room, we're going to be, you know, preoccupied and not paying attention and doing something else. And we'll just see what effect that has on him. At the end of that semester, that professor was teaching almost exclusively from the right side of the room. So on the last day of the class, they told this professor what they had done. And he said, I had no idea you guys were doing that. But it had this subliminal effect on him that he'd never recognized. Now, here's a professional man, a professor at a university who teaches this course of the subject that was just applied to him and he never recognized it. And I think about it in society, especially this past year, how little things have affected us. Can you think back of over a year ago, if you saw somebody wearing a mask, it was kind of strange and you, you kind of wanted to avoid them because it looked odd. Who wore these masks? Now, if you see somebody not wearing a mask, you don't want to get near them because we're afraid of spreading the germs. That's how we've been conditioned. That's how you can be conditioned. But I think about over the time period, what we may have lost in this country, and this country was, one of the main principles was religious freedom. And I wonder how little by little we may be losing that freedom. I think that the past year has identified some issues in our society. We're not as a religious a society as we once were. And I have done business with people that live in California and Oregon, and they tell me about things out there where the ch how restricted the church has become through this time and how they're restricted and even worshiping, yet the bars and abortion clinics are allowed to continue to operate why is it that places of worship are identified and where if there's gathering the even the governors there are are recommending to people that they tell the authorities when people get together yet they have been caught in secret having their own whether it's a political rally or a uh, or a party it's been really quite something to see this but have you noticed how the church is becoming more and more persecuted? About 20 years ago, um, I was on a, at the Bell Heath School, the Gideons were distributing these little testaments. When I was in school, the Gideons were allowed on, church, on the uh, school property. They didn't come in and preach to us. They, they just gave away free Bibles like today. Today, they're not allowed on the school property so we were outside and I gave this little girl a testament. About 10 minutes later, she came back to me and she said, I'm not sure I'm allowed to have this on school property. And I assured her that she was fully allowed to have a Bible on school property. But it really made me think, what are we doing to our children? How have we educated them to where it was once an admirable thing to have a Bible on you, so now we have to worry that we can't have a Bible on school property? That is, is something I think little by little we have not recognized. And I'm concerned about what might be happening. This next picture is uh, the uh, picture from the Shawshank Redemption. And the thing I took away from this movie is that there's a, a scene in it where Brooks, this old uh, prisoner who had been there virtually all of his life, uh, he got parole and he got very upset by this because his security was everything he knew in that prison. When he was released, he didn't know how to cope. He hadn't seen an automobile. He hadn't experienced all the new technology or the new ways of the new environment that he was thrust into. He couldn't cope with that and he ended up hanging himself because he couldn't cope. When the news got back to the prison and his friends within the prison that he had, uh, he had hung himself, one of the prisoners said, well, he was just crazy. 
But Red, the wise one of the bunch, he said he wasn't crazy. He was just institutionalized. And he said, what are you talking about? He just is crazy. He said, no, these walls are funny. He said, when you first get here, you hate them. When you've been here a while, you get used to them. And if you've been here long enough, you depend on them. That's being institutionalized. And I wonder how that change, that change in the frame of mind, that conditioning, that behavioral conditioning, how sometimes maybe we end up being adapted to the things of the world which takes us away from the teaching that Jesus and the direction that God would have us. I was absolutely flabbergasted when the pastor a few weeks ago announced that a faction of the Methodist church has broken away to focus on social issues over doctrinal teaching. I just can't imagine that. Social issues tend to change, but God's word remains constant. That's our pinning. That's our grounding. That keeps us from falling for any of these false teachings, false teachings of the world that would lead us astray. I, I was just, uh, I just have, uh, how have we gotten here? We've gotten here little by little, and I think this past year, the, another blessing from it has identified these kinds of things that we need to be aware of. We are commissioned to be the salt and the light to this world. I like to look at Jesus, who's the son of God, also being the sun that shines the light, and we're the moon that reflects that light. But how are we positioned to reflect that light and to reflect it purely? And for us to be salt of the earth that not only adds flavor, but also preserves. I think each one of us is commissioned to, uh, to have a purpose in life. We're to follow Christ, each with our own conscience, what we believe Christ would have us do. And we're also answerable for our actions and our inactions. I like this picture because it reminds me of the wise men following the star. They followed the light that was put before them. I think we need to be like the wise men of old and follow Christ's light so that we may truly reflect what he would have us do in this dark world. We're only one generation away from a generation of atheists, but we can have hope that we also could be one generation away from great evangelists. It's all in how we prepare the future generations. How are we preparing them? What are we doing and how, are we con how have we been conditioned and how are we conditioning our children? So we need to be careful that we do not become what we hate. How many times have you talked to somebody who like to pontificate how progressive and open and accepting they are until you discuss an issue which maybe they disagree with? They're accepting until the point that they don't agree with you. And then sometimes you get shut down or perhaps even called names or, or something else, being hypocritical and saying those things and then becoming exactly what you hate. As Christians, we cannot afford to fall into that trap. We cannot afford to be conformed to the world. If we follow Christ like, all of our social issues will be taken care of. We will no longer have those things that divide us in, in our country. If we focus on Jesus, we come together toward him, and we find that we have so much more in common than what separates us. We need to follow the star like the ancient um, sages and follow that Christ and not follow the lit billboards of this world that would tell us a lie. So as 2021 comes in, 
It doesn't mean that because we leave 2020 behind that all our problems have been left behind. Oh, oh no. And I'm sure many of us are feeling a degree of trepidation because we're not out of this yet. We still need to be responsible. And there could be future pandemics, but there's also spiritual pandemics that take place that we also need to guard against. So we, we go into 2021 with a degree of trepidation, but it's mixed with the hope that Christ's light will guide us in the right direction. So let us be the light unto the world that he would have us be, and that salt that gives the flavor, that distinction, and preserves. We would pray for new opportunities to share Christ with the world, and also that maybe we get reconditioned to better reflect that light and to be more tasty salt. So as the ushers come to so that we may exit in the proper way, let us go forth and shine the light of Christ that makes the difference in this world that desperately needs to know God and to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Thank you, and amen.